Hello again, welcome inside the Tier 4 studio here in Morgantown, West Virginia. It is Wednesday, there's a football game in three days. That means we have time for a question and answer segment here on Facebook Live. As always, with one little twist, um, it's usually 3.45. I apologize for starting late today. I've had uh, furnace issues at my house. If you saw where I was and what I looked like 15 minutes ago, it was... It was a Cinderella transfer complete with uh, ashes and soot to um, current state right now. So um, long story short, back to normal, a little cold in the house, still t-shirt weather, which is good, but the sun goes down, the temperature drops with it. I'm a little worried and probably need a uh, new furnace, so lots of holding my breath and drinking coffee, so find a way to, um, now that I think of it, if you'd like your brand on the chat and perhaps we can work out a sponsorship arrangement since I'm looking at a costly home improvement fix. So BB and T get at me. Anybody else? You're more than welcome to, uh, you're more than welcome to ask me some questions here as I talk to myself and hopefully you, I see many people joining the party right now, which is good. I have a few questions lined up to the side here at our earsports.com message board. Always welcome both sides of the aisle. Um, before we get started though, don't ever listen to me when it comes to television time. I think I told you last week it was Fox Sports 2. That is true this week. It was actually ESPNU last week. Fox Sports 2 this week, and that might not even be accurate. If you're rooting for Fox Sports 1, then you need to root for either the Yankees or the Astros to win these next two games. They go into Game 5 tonight. If it goes to Game 7, Game 7 of the ALCS will be on Fox Sports 1. If Houston or if New York... God forbid, wins the next two games. Well, then they get out in six. There is no need for a game seven. Fox Sports 1 is freed up. West Virginia hopeful, maybe even optimistic, that that game at Baylor gets moved over to Fox Sports 1. I'm not sure of the programming options. I'm not in the meeting room there. I'm not even sure West Virginia is. But they have better insight than I do. Um, so I'm going to follow their lead. Fox Sports 2, as long as the ALCS is decided. Um, Friday, I guess, correct? So if you're rooting for... Better viewing option Saturday night. Root for a 2-0 outcome here in these next two days. Baylor 0-6 overall, 12 straight regular season losses. It is amazing. I can remember sitting here in this space many years ago before it was cool to talk about, well, the space has always been cool, but I was talking about Baylor before it was cool and how that program was on its way, and then Baylor followed through. Flashy helmets, all sorts of bravado and swagger, spread offense, aggressive defense, didn't mind winning 68 to nothing, didn't mind winning 68 to 52. Had its own style. It was popular. Recruiting in Texas is never easy, and they found a way to do it. A lot of flash, a lot of substance, a lot of style. Things obviously went wrong. Didn't see anything like that coming, of course, but it was going to take something, well, obviously tragic. And, and when you look at the, the scope of the change and, and the outcry, probably devastating, right? Something large and devastating to derail what Baylor had going. Uh, don't want to spend any time on that. Obviously, um, pretty miserable situation down there for a lot of people involved. But football recovering now, um, slowly but surely, Matt Rule, from Temple is a change up. Um, it's kind of funny when you look at all of the coaching changes in the Big 12, and there have been many. Um, not many outliers, though. Daniel Holgerson was hired by Oliver Luck because he understood offense, um, and that happened to work pretty well when the school transitioned to the Big 12. Um, when Oklahoma was looking for its new coach, it stayed in house, but it wasn't going to change from what it's done, which is a variation of the air raid. Uh, Mike Leach has kept the offense the same, even though he's had different offensive coordinators since Dana Holgerson was there. Uh, when Kansas State changes, who knows? But when Kansas changed, they went to a guy who this past offseason hired a offensive coordinator who knows the air raid. You get my point here, though. Offense, offense, offense. Quarterbacks, receivers, points on the board. Scoring defense is the most important defensive category. Uh, Matt Rule's different. He's very much a uh, old Penn State kind of guy, right? Um, pro sets, fullbacks, tight ends. And he leans on defense. I'm not sure what the long term is here, but I think if he's trying to identify his strengths and weaknesses right now, um, maybe what he's doing isn't a bad idea. You kind of have a vanilla offensive defense sometimes, and you kind of stand out um, by doing what is maybe uh, not common to those positions. Perhaps you run your routes faster, you hit the holes harder in these, these um, again, plain 
traditional sets that are not customary in the Big 12. I think over time, though, he's going to evolve, maybe because he has to, but because he'll be able to prove more of his program and go over to recruits houses and high schools and show the fingerprints of what he's done. A lot of what the change is going to be is disciplinary and cultural. Um, right now, that hasn't translated to wins, but it's been a pretty tough team um, up until last week when they got housed at Oklahoma State on homecoming in Stillwater. The team was in every game, really close um lost some games that you probably should have won, including games that you really can't explain, like an FCS school or a small group of five school, but you also can't explain how they hung and probably should have beat Oklahoma, but um, hasn't gotten over the hump yet and was last week a regression? Maybe. It's kind of hard when you go from 0-1 to 0-2 all the way to 0-5, pick yourself back up and say, hey, if we went out, we get a bowl game. Well, probably wasn't going to happen. It didn't happen Saturday, but 0-6, their last chance for bowl eligibility, I guess, is to not lose Saturday. It'll be good to be home. Last time they were home, you know, again, hung around with Oklahoma, maybe should have beat them, but not the Baylor you're used to, except you'll see some people that you know. Offense, a handful of people. Defense, a handful of people. Those are their best players, which is to be expected, but they're playing a ton of people. A lot of them are new or unproven, and in large regard, it's an audition for the future for those players and for the head coach and his coordinators to figure out who they have what they can do, and how they will align going forward. So 8 o'clock on one of the Fox channels. West Virginia opened at 11.5 points. It's down to 9 right now, depending on where you get your information. But expecting kind of a high-scoring game there on both ways when you look at the over-under. Uh, wouldn't be surprising. Um, talent both sides, speed both sides, and West Virginia has to put together that full game on defense yet. Perhaps this is the one. I think that's the one outcome that co the coaches in Golden Blue probably want to see. Can they play four quarters consistently and not have that up and down on the defensive side of the ball? Let's go to the questions here. First one, uh, personal feelings on this Baylor game. Do you believe we'll win handily, or will this be something akin to the Baylor-Oklahoma game where we just barely make it out with a win? I don't I don't know that West Virginia has the, the complete roster, the complete package to smoke anybody right now um certainly kansas would be that team and had a hard time putting kansas away can play with anybody but it's probably um one of those teams that's going to let teams play alongside too um again baylor baylor can design plays to score and can design plays to stop the pass and the run i think if um if you look at west virginia you're probably going to try to stop their pass right now and see if they can get their running game back on track um we'll see on that one there i think it's an interesting game west virginia has, has really had to challenge itself so far this season to get up for games, right? Um, and has been lucky a couple of times too, I think, with, with the way that things have aligned with them. You know, they play an FCS team. That's a, a terrible opponent, hard to get up. They played all right on that one. But before that, they played ECU. You'd think that'd be easy, but ECU was not very good and had lost to an FCS team. And the spin was, well, it's it's the best FCF, SDF, FCS team. Then you go to Kansas and Kansas isn't very good. Well, it's the first Big 12 game. Well, okay. So the spin that the coaches can apply to all these games against lesser opponents, uh, what do they do with Baylor? Well, Baylor has spanked West Virginia the past couple of times. They've been down in Waco, Texas. Totally different situation, but that's a place they haven't won yet, a place they haven't played well. Um, I think that's the motivation this week. But I think it's dangerous. A night game, the crowd will be wild. I think that um, they're probably smarting a little bit from what happened against Oklahoma State. That's a total flip from the what the script had been. I'd want to get it back to normal. I think you'll see the coaches probably focus on a handful of things they do really well. Probably have identified by getting exposed as still water the things they can't do very well. Um, I don't think you'll see a very exotic or um, multiple attack. You'll probably see just repeated iterations and different formations of what they can do on offense and defense. Just try to find a way to, to make sure that Will Greer isn't throwing passes over your head. But I do think it's dangerous. Um, I do think you're going to see a lot of points too. Second question, now where is Wesco? And are there plans to get him more involved in the second half of the season? He plays, he's specifically a blocking guy. Um, he's a tight end on the line of scrimmage. I think you've seen him in some sets where they go really big, either in short yardage or goal line sets. Um, one career reception, but one touchdown. He's been efficient. Uh, can they sneak him on the field more? I don't know. But to be honest with you, he's not in their, their top, well, I guess their top 10, as I like to say, of their offensive players. If you put him on the field, who are you taking off? You're taking off a receiver, which means Marcus Sims or David Sills or Gary Jennings. And then you're probably taking Eli Wellman off the field, too, unless you have a set that we haven't seen where they can play with a tight end on the line and a fullback in the backfield. That may be something that evolves in the future. Very much up to Wesco, but, you know, we're a year and a half into this now. Um, sometimes the answer is the answer, and the question hasn't changed. Um, 
up to him. But there's certainly an opportunity. And it's one of those things where, if not now, when? Because Giovanni Haskins is going to be eligible next year. And they have two tight ends committed. There's talk of maybe another one joining. He could be a defensive end. He could be a tight end. Uh, if you can't do it now and they really need it, uh, they're going to need it now next next year. Does that make sense? They're going to need it next year, and they're going to have more options. So uh, he really has about a six-game window here to get himself on the field and to stay on the field. But I think the hard part about that whole thing is who do you take off the field? Your best players are your receivers and your fullback. Um, if you're going to have Wesco on the field, then in place of who? I don't know that there's a really good answer to that. That makes sense to put him on the field. Um, odds on Greer declaring for the NFL this season if it continues trending in the direction it has been heading. 50-50, I guess, cop out, ooh, I understand, but um, either he does or he doesn't. I don't know his personal situation. I know he's not destitute. Uh, I know he has a wife and a kid, but I know he likes it here. I know he has friends and family on the team. Um, I know that it's not like he's going to go home and hang out in Charlotte because he's out of his eligibility next year either. Um, you know, the NFL is going to be there for him. Um, it looks like a lot of teams are going to need quarterbacks this year. If you look at the NFL right now, how many teams have a quarterback in a situation where they won't need one for a number of years? Very, very few. Quarterbacks are assets that you collect. Um, good teams and bad teams have them. You know, a number of them, too. New England has the best one, maybe, of all time. Um, and they've kept Jimmy Garoppolo around because they need him. Perhaps for a game or six games, but perhaps in the future. You don't want to give away a guy. Then you see what the Browns have done, collecting quarterbacks and, and hoping one of them sticks. That's kind of the way you do it. Um... Similar to how you recruit quarterbacks, too, which is what West Virginia's done. You get a David Israel, and you get a Jack Allison, and you find a way to get Will Greer on campus, and you recruit Chris Chuganov, and you got a bunch of guys, and maybe one of them works. I think it's similar in the NFL, but that can kind of marginalize um, the value of some players. If you're Will Greer, and you're told you're a third-round pick, are you going to get in a roster that has a bunch of guys already, and you're going to have to compete to prove yourself, and it's your one first shot? I don't know how he views that, but I think there's a better situation. And perhaps if he's told, hey, I'm a first-round guy this year, heck, get out of here, man. Don't stay around. Um, if he's told that if you come back and do this again, you'll be a first-round guy next year, but you're a third-round guy this year, maybe you want to stay. Um, it's too early, I think, um, if it continues. If he's at 42 touchdowns and 6,000 yards or whatever, something crazy happens here toward the end, 6,000 would be very crazy. I'm sorry. Let's say 4,500 yards. But 40 touchdowns, 4,500 yards, if the team is – I don't know, 9-3, and three and, and he's, you know, first team all Big 12. I don't think the all-conference of the All-America stuff matters. I think the tape does. But if he's able to wiggle around and throw touchdowns and be accurate and avoid interceptions and, and kind of have a leadership about him, um, certainly he has a chance. But, again, watch how many other quarterbacks enter the draft. Uh, Davis Webb, for example, third-round pick by the Giants. Um, could be starting for them sometime in the future. They like him an awful lot. Got him late. Um, but, again, there were a lot of quarterbacks who came out early this year and knocked him down the pole a little bit. So, um, very complex conversation. Far too early. And by, by the way, enjoy it. Spinning balls in the air and catching touchdown passes in the end zone. That's fun to see, right? Uh, don't count your chickens on this one yet. Kenny Robinson looks promising, but ultimately we don't know if he ends up bulking up or playing spur outside linebacker. I tell you what, two weeks ago I would have said that was crazy. But the fact that he's kind of been supplanted and, and, and has given up touchdowns the past two games, maybe, maybe long term. Uh, he's not a cornerback. Maybe he is a defensive back with a, another position. Uh, outside linebacker, I think he would have redshirted this year just to, to add the weight and the muscle. Um, but maybe safety, perhaps. A spur, bandit, I don't know, free. He was free before he moved. But, um, again, two weeks ago, I would have said the money in the future is at the cornerback. But, yeah, maybe you're right right now. Uh, but you move on, though, here. And you say, uh, where are Jake Long and Sean Mahone? in their development. Hakeem Bailey, Fontez Davis. I think Fontez Davis, I don't believe he's played yet, so he's probably on track to redshirt. Um, you've seen Hakeem Bailey, and I don't mean this in the bad way, but this is the best way I can say it. That's probably why you haven't seen Jake Long and Sean Mahone. I really thought Jake Long was going to play this year. He had a great camp. Teammates liked him. Coaches liked him. Hadn't happened yet, um, but you can't put guys in the field who make mistakes, and that's what happened to Bailey. He's been out there, and, and he's made errors that have cost the defense. Um, you can't go any deeper than that. If that's a guy you can't trust to play solid and to close out plays, which ironically is, is what he was known for in camp in the preseason. But uh, if you can't trust that guy and he's your fourth guy, you really don't want to dip down into five and six and seven and get guys out there who can't play at a level to get above that fourth guy. Um, special teams was okay for them. That's the action that they've been they've been involved in so far. They play corner late in games. But um, you know, they probably have an okay thing right now. Probably nobody happier than 
Doug Belk, the cornerback coach, to see Elijah Battle, you know, respond and rebound and get back into the starting lineup. Uh, Kenny Robinson is is a good player, raw, a work in progress, talented. He can certainly start and play. Mike Daniels has been solid on the other side. So you have three. You'd like to have four or five, but I think the fact that they can play some coverage with their safeties that helps right now, and that lets them, you know, kind of hold that that leash a little tighter when it comes to Bailey Long and Mahomes. But um, again, long season. Certainly time for, for one of those guys to get in. Um, I was surprised they only played three cornerbacks last week. A lot of snaps, a lot of receivers. And if Bailey couldn't get in the field that game, the second time in three games he hasn't played, doesn't speak well for the, the future, at least this season, immediately for those other guys to get in front of him and to get out on the field. Um, what else? Uh, not trying to discount junior college. Oh, all right, we talked about that one, I guess. Uh, last but not least, what's your insight on Isaiah Hardy's future on the offensive line? Too tall to be a guard or footwork too bad to play tackle? Um, I'm surprised he didn't redshirt this year, and I'm surprised that they threw him in a guard, but that's obviously where, you know, he, you don't want a big guy who can't move but can push people to tackle because mm -hmm. what else he's doing is, um, probably getting your quarterback hurt if he can't move and he's trying to shove people. You can do that at guard in tight spots, um, Pretty clear he didn't know exactly what he was doing in the offense, but he could use his size and his girth to be effective in spots. Um, long term, I think that probably means he's a guard. I think they'll give him an opportunity though, to play tackle if he can. You, you can't teach that size. Um, that's what he had been, but you know, I think it's a good point. Is he too big to play guard? He's too big to play center, um, and I mean height-wise. We're talking, what, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, right? Um, ideally, that's what your left tackle looks like, your right tackle. But um, if you can stick yourself in there and you can move people around a guard, Quentin Spain turned out pretty good. Similar size there. Um, you know, we'll see what happens there. But again, surprised that they didn't have an answer and they put him out there. But they had a need and he could fulfill that. Um, one of the great appeals of him in recruiting was he had a redshirt year available. Um, still does, I guess. But you know, you have one fewer now, so of uh, the overall year because he played this year. Um, I think he'll have a chance. He's obviously going to be front of the line when they're trying to replace Lingafelter and Bosch. That probably is a good indication of where he'll start. They're going to lose some seniors there. They're going to need him um, or anybody else to play guard soon next season. Um, let's see. Uh, Zach Hopkins asks, what are the chances of Greer returning for a senior season if he continues to play this well? Whenever that one. Uh, you might have actually popped into the room and asked that earlier. So um, again, 50-50, but I think if he plays well, um, you want him to go pro, right? It'd be great to have him back next year, but uh, at the very worst, there is a succession plan in place. Chris Chuganov will know the offense. Jack Allison was recruited for a reason, um, not, a, not an empty cupboard. So I don't think uh, I don't think Greer will make a bad decision based on variables he can and can't control there. Uh, Dylan Geard is Quantel Reigns visiting the Oklahoma State game. Uh, I'm going to tell you the truth, Dylan. Um, I have no idea, to be honest with you. Um, I probably should know that, but I can't tell you the truth in that one. I've, I've tracked him a little bit because there's obviously some smoke. Um, I think he's a good fit, and there's some things uh, peripherally and, and, and within you know the, the visible scope that makes sense. I think he fits in the defense, but I think that there's a culture fit for him, and he knows some people, and it'll, it'll work out well. But don't know where he stands right now. I think I've heard that before, but um, how about this? You bug me and uh, ask me, and I'll try to track down an answer for you. Uh, next one, Mountaineer Sports Updates. Do you think WV will make more of a game with Oklahoma this year? Well, it depends where Oklahoma's at um, at this point. Um, one loss right now, but going to play Oklahoma State before that, right? I'm uh, going to play TCU before that. The team that couldn't handle Iowa State and, um, you know, first-time starting quarterback. So you're looking at teams with very complete rosters and attacks and, and much better quarterbacks and much better offenses than Iowa State. Um, can they take one or two more losses? I mean, for all we know, West Virginia could be in second place in the Big 12 and Oklahoma could be in third. So um, a lot of things about Oklahoma I just don't yet know. Um, don't play very good defense. Uh, doesn't seem like they are fans of the officials or vice versa. Sounds familiar, right? Um and again, just, just haven't played well apart from their quarterback. If you take their quarterback out, you know, this this offense is not nearly as good. Now, it's true at a lot of places, but in Oklahoma where you're letting him run around and, and ad-lib and fling it when, you know, maybe others wouldn't or can't, you know, that makes a difference. And, and that can save you sometimes from bad drives or bad plays. But don't forget, this is the same team that, that went to Ohio State and, and really had its way for 30 minutes of football. It looked very impressive. It looked like... Maybe not the best team in the country, but certainly in the conversation for a, an obvious spot in the Final Four, but has had issues since, um, has given up a lot of passing yards to teams that are, are good offensively and maybe not as good offensively, and they're going to see some good offenses coming up. So, um, you know, it's a bad thing, I think, that they get them at the end of the year because 
Um, you know, teams figure things out, but conversely, um, opponents figure things out too. And sometimes chink in the armors become, you know, big holes in the chest protection. And uh, you can't protect yourself if, you know, if there's 11 games on tape of guys throwing certain patterns or throwing at certain cornerbacks and safeties mm-hmm. and you don't have anybody better. Um, if there's routines that, I guess patterns, I should say, of performance that opponents have put on film that this tactic works and this approach works, never mind this formation and this play, uh, you know, you can get exploited. So let's see how Oklahoma covers up. But the same is absolutely true for West Virginia. I do think it's um it's a good matchup here just because the offense can help. What West Virginia has done with in the past couple of seasons is, is matching scores for scores with Oklahoma. They tried, but, you know, they got down so fast so soon last year, kind of ran out of time. Did find some offensive continuity. Um, I don't think you're going to see one of those 16 to nine games or whatever it was a couple years ago, down in Norman. Uh, I believe that is all of the questions I have for you. So um, if you have one, fire it off here before I wrap it up. But um, again, um, check out uh, what happens in the ALCS if you want to figure out what channel the game is on. Tentatively, Fox Sports Two. West Virginia kind of thinks it'll go to Fox Sports One if there isn't a Game Seven. Uh, so go Astros. Seriously, I don't want to see the Yankees. Um, But that's it for this time. I'll see you next time. Go Tribe.